Um, hi, my name is Katie Courtney, and my topic for ISM is counseling psychology. My mission statement is to help patients become the best version of themselves possible through counseling and to help provide therapy to patients with the highest quality programs as possible to help the patient become successful in their daily life. My quote is, if opportunity doesn't knock, build a door. This relates to counseling psychology because a lot of the time whenever you have a patient, they think that you're the one that does everything for them and with your counseling then they get better. But many times uh, you have to give them the steps and the patient or the client has to do everything, well not everything, but they have to do most of the work on their own because you can't do more work than your client is doing. So if their opportunity doesn't knock, then you have to build a foundation for them and show them that they have to help themselves in order for you to help them. The type of counseling that I'd like to do someday is children and young adults, so range of 8 to 17 years old. Um, I'd like to work on the more older kids also. I'd like to be with clients that battle depression, anxiety disorders, and possible substance abuse. So here are my interview assessments. The first interview I went to, her name was Elizabeth Beebe, and her office is in Frisco, Texas. She sees more of couples and adults. Uh, she also deals with marriage counseling mainly, marriage and divorce. So whenever clients come into her, she rarely sees adolescents or younger adults. She sees couples and adults and she counsels them through Christian counseling as well. She owns her private, her own private practice and she works through a church called Centennial Church. The second interview I had was with Christine Price and her office is in Allen, Texas. And she has a private practice but it is a partnership so she has uh, someone that owns her private practice with her. Her environment, her office is very centered towards family. Uh, whenever we were at our interview, she actually had two of her dogs with her because she said that whenever she has um, counseling sessions with her clients, they feel more comfortable whenever there's animals sometimes. So she brings her dogs to keep them calm down. Uh, she has no specific age range that she works with, but she does deal mostly with anger management and anxiety. My next interview was down in Dallas, Texas with Dr. Brad Schwal, and he owns his own private practice, and his, his private practice is much different from the rest of the counselors that I mes met with, because he has many counselors working under him, as well as secretaries and people who uh, talk to the, the clients about how they'll pay for the sessions, but his favorite part about counseling is the business side. So not necessarily just sitting and talking with his clients, but dealing with the insurance. And he likes the way that, that he owns his private practice, and so he, he likes being the boss of it, basically. My next interview was with Matt McKinney, and he, his office is in Frisco, Texas as well. And he focuses mostly on adolescent boys and young men uh, through Christian counseling. And the way that Matt McKinney was very different is because I felt like his environment, his office was very home, like it was very home oriented and very comfortable. He was a very nice man. He was actually my second choice for my mentor. Um, but I would like to, okay, so this is my mentor, Tara Wiedemeyer. And she is, or she's a licensed professional counselor and her office is in Frisco, Texas. Um, she uses research-based approaches and is trained in relaxation therapy, expressive arts, addiction, play therapy, and chemical use and substance abuse. Um, she mainly works with adolescents, but she also works with children as well and some adults, but not very often. Her office, she works alongside a psychiatrist, and so she's able to refer out people if she needs to. Um, and then another interview that I had was with Tiffany Ashenfelter. And her, the way that she did her private practice was different because she, hers is a partnership alongside her husband. And so she and her husband, she deals with more of the um, female clients and he deals with more of the male clients. 
and so they kind of they work together and um, he her husband is more she said that her husband's more of the he likes the more like counseling face to face time but she is more um, interested in the she likes to focus on the business side of counseling so with the insurance and everything um, but she does specialize in anxiety and depression in teenage girls. Um, that's my mentor and her son on the right, and then me and my mentor on the left. So my research assessments, um, I covered in the first one, what is a licensed professional counselor? And basically, um, with that, I learned more about what a licensed professional does, both with their client and behind their client's um, sessions. So with their client, it's mainly you take like intake sessions and then you create a treatment plan and you work alongside them to help them out. But behind the client, you work more on the insurance side of things and what you should do to try and help them. Uh, so you have to work on like treatment plans and stuff outside of the sessions. Uh, and then I did a, an, or an assessment over family counseling as well because I did not really know anything about family counseling. And so I decided to look up what that was. And when that, with that, I learned that many counselors have their entire, or the client's entire family come in. If there's having like an issue in the family, or if the child is acting up, it's nice to just be able to have everyone there to talk because you can see multiple sides of what's going on at home. Um, I then did a play therapy assessment. And basically, play therapy is for younger children, and you, you hang out with them in a playroom where there's toys and there, there's hands-on learning material there. And so that helps the child open up to you and tell you more about um, what's going on at home and how they feel and everything because it's not just sitting in the scary doctor's office room and talking to a stranger. They get to be more playful, have some fun. Um, and then I did an article over effective addiction treat treatment. And from that article, I learned if, about how many doctors think that the addiction treatment that goes on in counseling, se counseling sessions doesn't always work very well. And so um, with that article, it told me that they're trying to find new methods of ways to get to clients in a more uh, relatable and easy way for them to understand. Then at UNT, I took a therapeutic play class where we learn more about how a child should do things for themselves that they're able to do for themselves. So if a child can dress themselves, then they should be able to dress themselves and you should let them because it provides them learning activities and they can start to do things for themselves instead of being um, resistant to being individual people. And then in the child development class at UNT, I learned more about how child or how children grow up under different parental roofs so we talked about how there are some children that grow up with a mom and a dad or some children that grow up with their grandparents or their aunts and uncles or if they have homosexual parents and we talked about how that development how they develop differently within different environments at home For my original work, I decided alongside my count or alongside my mentor that we would create an imaginary client where we would come up with a treatment plan for him and we would um, do different assessments on him and diagnose him and have counseling sessions where we can help him get back on track where him and his, his mom were comfortable with how they were. So we decided on making our client's name Mason Freeman, and he's a 16-year-old student. Um, so the client intake form is very basic, and it's the standard type of form that you would fill out at any appointment that you schedule before your first appointment at any doctor's office, really. Um, and if you're a minor, your parent or guardian must fill this out. So here's the client intake form that we made for Mason. It has his name, address, phone number, email for the mom. Um, it talks about permission to email people, emergency contacts, the household information. Uh, it talks about religious preparation, um, but you don't have to 
fill that out if you don't want to. It talks about how you got here. So we said that Mason Freeman was referred by his pediatrician. Um, and then up there, we said the reason for the visit today was that his mom was seeing that he was moody and he seemed kind of depressed also. And so she wanted to take him in for some extra help. Um, there's some information about his pediatrician. And then at the bottom, we said that his stressors were school, baseball, and his parents. And so that can kind of help the counselor see what kind of background that he is from. And then his mom signed that. Uh, the informed consent, it covers emergency, crisis, qualifications and supervision, counseling relationship boundaries, effects of counseling, client rights, referrals, cancellations, records and confidentiality, phone call policies, fees, court policies, and termination policies. After each explanation of the policies, the client or the parent or guardian must initial. So basically there's just a short little paragraph about each of those on what um, is expected of both the counselor and the client. HIPAA is the U.S. Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996 and it is designed to provide privacy standards to protect the patient's medical records and other health information provided to health plans, doctors, hospitals, and other health care providers. So you have to sign that as well. Our initial assessment over Mason Freeman is the first thing that was covered during our first appointment with him. Um, this shows us, the counselors, a little bit more about himself as well as his background. The initial assessment helps the counselor out when they're ready to diagnose, if applicable, because, because some counselors, they don't diagnose their patients because they don't feel comfortable doing it, um, which is okay, and then make a treatment plan. So our initial assessment for Mason was that he has a little bit of trouble take, or going to sleep. It takes him a little bit long. Um, and he said, and it's a very important to say quotes of what Mason said because that helps with insurance as well because it shows them that we're not just making up anything he said, which wouldn't be ethical anyways, but it's just more proof. Um, and so we filled out a lot of things about sleep, his appetite, his ir irritability, um, crying spells. It's just, it's kind of like how he's been lately. Um, it talks about if he's ever attempted suicide or had suicidal thoughts, um, homicidal thoughts, or any relatives, if he has a drug or alcohol problem. Um, and we gave Mason a little bit of an issue with marijuana, but it's not anything major that he is dealing with. And so we just wanted to put that a little bit in there so that we could help that with his treatment plan. Uh, and then it talks about his medical history as well his grades, his behavioral issues, his friendship relationship. Um, then we also said that he has two younger siblings, Matthew and Macy, at home. Um, and then this was pretty important for us to put on here, that his significant losses were that his best friend just moved away and his grandpa died yes, last year and they were close to each other. So that we put would, um, that would put some more of the weight on the depression side of Mason's life. Um, and then we put down some more stressors for him. And then we, you have to ask the client about what their goals for therapy is. Because if they come into therapy just blind and they don't know what they want, that's going to make the counselor's job a little bit more difficult because the client might not be more willing to actually work to try and get better. So then you sign the um, intake session page, and you just take. We use the bottom to take a few more notes about um, what Mason said. So you say things like, "His mom came in for the last ten minutes of the session." Um, he reports feeling anxious and depressed since sophomore year. He's a junior now, also because he's 16. And then we said that he abused, or he appears to be abusing pot, but he's not dependent at this point either. So just a few um, things that we jotted down just to maybe help with us with the diagnosis. So we use the Beck's Depression Inventory, and this was created by Aaron T. Beck, and it's a 21-question, multiple-choice, self-report in inventory. 
and it's one of the most widely used instruments for measuring the severity of depression. This is Mason's uh, depression inventory. So you would circle zero for you don't feel whatever it is asking you, and three if you feel it very much. Um, and then you total up all the points at the end, and one to 10 is the ups and downs are normal. 11 to 16, you have a little bit of mood disturbance, which is what Mason ended up being diagnosed with. Um, 17 to 20 is borderline clinical depression. 21 to 30 is moderate depression, and 31 to 40 is severe depression. Over 40 is extreme depression, and you would, at that point, uh, reference him out to a psychiatrist. The Burns Anxiety Inventory is an assessment tool used to measure anxiety. It was developed by a psychiatrist named David Burns. The inventory is self-administered self or it can be administered by a clinician too. It just helps you monitor, monitor your anxiety over time and you can be more aware of your symptoms. It's the same type of thing with the zero to three number scale and at the end you total it all up and it has the zero to five is little or no, five to 10 borderline, 20 mild, 21 to 30 is moderate, 50 is severe, and then anything above that you would also refer them out. Creating a treatment plan is after the initial assessment but before the counseling sessions and the counselor must come up with some sort of treatment plan. Uh, the treatment plan is composed by putting together what was discovered from the initial assessment as well as information from the DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Man Manual of Mental Disorders. And basically that book just has all of the known mental disorders with some codes that you can help diagnose with. So this is our treatment plan for Mason. Uh, we have to have his mom sign it as well as the counselor. So we put down his history. His diagnosis, which we said was a generalized anxiety disorder, uh, his therapy goals, treatment methods, and just more about his sessions. The contact log is important when dealing with insurance and it helps us to be able to assess when a session was and who it was with so you can have family or individual sessions. So we put a contact log down for Mason. Uh, these progress worksheets, I included the first and the last progress worksheet to see how it changed, but they assess the mood, affect, presentation, cognition, risk assessment, critical impairment, diagnosis, goals for treatment, and his homework, if, if any. There's not always homework. So our first um, paper, it basically assesses when the meeting was, what time it was. He was neutral and calm for all of it, but we wanted to talk about relationship and family and school and his mood during that session. So we X'd off all of those. And then we put a three, which is severe anxiety next to anxiety, um, and slight depressed mood thinking and slight substance abuse. So we put his diagnosis, uh, which is generalized anxiety disorder, and we used the Burns and BDI inventory. So the, we put his progress and his key treatment goals. We put, number one was to manage his anxiety. Number two was to uh, stop his marijuana usage. And number three was, his, was to develop depression coping skills. Uh, we gave him breathing exercises just for the first night, just kind of have some first session calm treatments. And then here is his last paper. And you can see that we talked about pretty much everything that we used before, um, but we have achieved more of a treatment for him. So he, we decided to terminate Mason after this um, session. So through licensed professional counseling in ISM so far, I have learned more about what I can do as a counselor in, um, in counseling sessions with clients and the type of steps that counselors use in everyday lives to try and treat their patients as well as things that they do outside of their sessions to become a good counselor as well. Thank you very much for listening to my speech.